Chapter 12, The Molecular Biology of Inheritance. <clears throat> so this is the chapter we explore the genetic material, uh, finding the molecule or the material that must be able to store information that pertains to the development, structure, and metabolic activities of the cell. It is stable enough so that it can be replicated and able to undergo changes, which we will call mutations. So at this point, we don't know what that genetic molecule is, but there is a race to discover it. And that race began in 1869 when we discovered the, the molecules known as nucleic acids. Uh, Swiss physician Johannes Frederick Meisner isolated the chemical called uh, what he called nuclein at the time from the pus of the nuclei of pus cells. And basically, those nucleins are now called today DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. Please know how to uh, pronounce and spell its name. And the other nucleic acid being RNA, ribonucleic acid. So once we figured out uh, about DNA and RNA, we wanted to know which molecule was uh, responsible for inheritance. And today we know that that molecule is the uh, DNA, is the genetic material responsible for inheritance, and we talk about genetics. But let's go through a little bit of the history about how that came to be. So during the late 1920s, a bacteriologist, Frederick Griffith, was attempting to develop a vaccine against Streptococcus pneumoniae, uh, also called pneumonococcus. Um, and pneumonococcus would lead to the disease, pneumonia. And when you become very sick with that, you could die from it. So in Griffith's, Griffith's experiment, he studied the concept of bacterial transformation. And that's when, uh, if you think of a transformer, it could go from some type of machine device and then change into this robot. Well, here you have a uh, bacterium, bacterial transformation, that can go from a non-pathogenic strain which means it would not cause a disease, to a pathogenic strain. And a pathogen is an organism that causes, causes a particular disease. In this case, Streptococcus pneumoniae, or pneumonococcus, is a pathogen for pneumonia. So if you look at Frederick Griffith's experiment, uh, he injected a live uh, S strain uh, that has capsules into a mouse and the mouse ended up getting uh, pneumonia and dying. And then he injected a live R strain, which has no capsule, and basically that's the non-pathogenic form into the mouse, and the mouse continued to live. Then what he did is Griffith took a, injected a heat-killed S strain, and the mouse stayed alive, because we know that when you heat bacteria, it kills them. So then he took an injected heat-killed strain, S strain, and he took a live cultured R strain, which is the non-pathogenic version. So he took a heat shock pathogenic version and a live non-pathogenic version and injected them in the mouse. And what happened is over time, the mouse got sick and eventually died. So the live S strain is withdrawn from the mouse and, and of course, we did see that happen. So that was a bacterial transformation. So the pathogenic strain converted or transform the non-pathogenic strain uh, into the mouse, and then eventually that mouse ended up dying. So now there is a curiosity. What caused that to happen? Was it DNA, which is not a protein, or was it RNA, or was it a protein molecule itself? Well, to answer that question, we have to turn to the Hershey and Chase experiment. So Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase uh, did an experiment which relied on the chemical differences between DNA and protein to solve whether DNA or protein was genetic material. And if you look, here is a phage, a bacteriophage. This is the T2 bacteriophage, which is a virus that will infect bacteria cells. And if you look at the basic structure of a phage, you have the uh, basic protein coat on the outside, and you have a head region, and inside the head, you have the nucleic acid DNA, you have a tail, and then you have the base. So at this point, we want to know, is it a DNA, a nucleic acid, or a protein that is responsible for inheritance? So if you look, uh, 
what Hershey and Chase did in their experiment is they used radioactive isotopes. So they used radioactive phosphorus and used that on, on the nucleic acid. And basically, uh, when the bacteria and viruses are cultured together, radioactive viral DNA entered the bacterium. So if you add radioactive phosphorus, what they saw was when they examined the bacteria after it went through a, a centrifuge, they found uh, bacterial sediments are radioactive and they had that radioactive phosphorus, unlike when they uh, used the sulfur, uh, radioactive sulfur was aimed at targeting the protein coat. So if radioactive sulfur would have been found in the bacterial cells, then that would have meant that protein was a nucleic acid or was the molecule responsible for the inheritance of genes. But that is not the case. It was the, the phosphorus, the radioactive phosphorus they found inside the bacteria cell and that was targeted at the DNA there. So basically, uh, what Hershey and Chase did in their experiment was to uh, support the idea that it's DNA and not protein that is responsible for uh, inherited traits. So DNA and RNA are polymers of nucleotides. Uh, nucleic acid contains only nucleotides. It's a polynucleotide when we talk about DNA and RNA. The nucleotides are, are the monomer subunits. And these uh, nucleotides are composed of a nitrogen-containing base, a phosphate, and a pentose 5-carbon sugar. If you're talking about DNA, that 5-carbon sugar is deoxyribose. If you're talking about RNA, that pentose 5-carbon sugar is ribo. So DNA... So we know that the nucleic acids, uh, if you talk about DNA, DNA has uh, nucleotides, and there are four basic nucleotides known as adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. Or you could abbreviate those names with an A, G, T, or C. And here we could see the typical structure of a nucleotide where you have the pentose sugar, a phosphate group, and then, of course, the nitrogenous base. And you can see that the backbone of a nucleic acid is alternating sugar phosphate and then coming off of the five prime sugar there, five carbon sugar, you have your one of three, one of four, sorry, uh, nucleotides. So the four nucleotides in DNA are adenine, guanine. These two nucleotides are called purines. And then you have cytosine and thymine. Those are called pyrimidines. P-Y-R-I-M-I-D-I-N-E-S, if you cannot read that there. These are the pyrimidines. Ribonucleic acid, RNA, is another polymer of nucleotides. RNA differs from DNA um, because it does not have deoxyribose as its 5-carbon sugar, but instead has ribose. And it also has a nucleotide called uracil that replaces thymine, which is found in DNA. RNA is also single-stranded, where DNA is a double-stranded helix. So uh, DNA is a double helix, RNA is an alpha helix, which means it has one strand. There are three different types of RNA that we'll discuss when we get into uh, molecular biology. So DNA met the criteria for the genetic material. Uh, the genetic material must be that of DNA because it's variable between species and able to store the information that causes species to vary from one another. It's also constant within a particular species and able to be replicated with high fidelity during cell division. And DNA is also able to undergo rare changes called mutations that provide genetic variability uh, that allows evolution to occur. So uh, a gentleman by the name of Erwin Chargaff with the uh, discovery of DNA being the, the molecule responsible for this, Chargaff came up with his rules for base pairing. So the percentage, complementary base pairing, means that the percentage of cytosine is relatively equal to, to the percentage of guanine, and the percentage of adenine is relatively equal to the percentage of thymine. So percent A equals percent T, percent G equals percent C. So to do a problem, DNA analysis indicates 20% thymine in a molecule. What is the percentage 
of all other nitrogenous bases. Well, if you have 20% thymine, that means you must have uh, approximately 20% adenine, which is 40% of the molecule. Therefore, the other 60% must come from guanine and cytosine, so divided between the two, they'd be 30% each to equal 60%. So you'd have 30% cytosine and 30% guanine. DNA is a double helix. Um, the double helix suggests that the stability and variability of the molecule is in the sequence of bases. Uh, basically, when we had the race for the structure of DNA in the early 1950s, late 1940s, uh, one of the pieces of evidence that led to the structure of DNA being a double helix was a, a uh, crystal X-ray diffraction pattern, uh, crystal, crystallography graph that was done by Rosalind Franklin. And Rosalind Franklin uh, never received a Nobel Prize for her work in the discovery of DNA because she passed on before she was given a lot of credit for DNA structure. The two people that did receive the Nobel Prize for DNA structure were James Watson and Francis Crick. And basically they discovered the structure of DNA, were able to describe how it stored the hereditary information and how it could be replicated. So if you look here is Watson and Crick in, in the model they built and as far as uh, discovering DNA structure. So DNA can be duplicated or replicated as we would say. And we'll talk about that uh, in our next lecture.